Designing and balancing games can be incredibly hard. We all understand that. But there's this interesting problem that games today might have to account for that they didn't necessarily have to think about over a decade ago, which is competition. It's no secret that esports, in regard to proper organized play with salaries, franchises, and facilities, gets bigger all the time. Esports, without a doubt, will be the future of global competition because it's already on that path, but with organized top tier play being vital and important in this industry, it's also not the only way that games have become more competitive, with many titles using some sort of competitive ranking system in their PvP game modes. While a big reason that PvP has become more popular is due to stronger internet connections, it's also because it's very interesting to test your skills by proving you're better than other people in the game. It makes every match a more unique experience, and it's a lot different to try and cheese players and exploit them the same way that you can a game's AI. Now this does not mean that PvE is bad or anything like that, in fact some of my favorite games of all time are either PvE based or single player. I've enjoyed the absolute crap out of Valheim with my friends over the last month and I was addicted to it for about a week, it was like the only thing that I wanted to do. But that being said, PvE experiences can sometimes be tied to another word, casual. Though there are definitely hardcore and competitive PvE experiences, when you're not constantly putting your skills up to the test against other players, it's a lot easier to take the game a bit more casually. Very different from saying, wow, the AI is strong, knowing that another human being is better than you and can beat you with their skills and knowledge of the game lights a fire under all of us to get better. One of the biggest side effects of these games, however, is how in the world do you make it fair for everyone? How can you ensure that everyone has a fun experience? Where do you draw the line when you nerf and buff things because of esports and the competitive scene when 99.9% .9 of all players are not pros? How can so many people despise a system like what we have in League of Legends, yet plenty of others say it's just fine? Let's do a deep dive into what makes pro play both good and bad for the average player. Browsers are something that we all use every day but rarely change. However, today I want to tell you why you should use my sponsor, Opera GX. Opera GX is the world's first dedicated gaming browser with tons of helpful features, most notably the GX Player. This is your easy access music hub where you can use any of the three big music platforms, Apple Music, Spotify, and YouTube Music. You also get direct control over your computer's resources, including CPU, RAM, and bandwidth limiters. It empowers you with seamlessly integrated applications like Twitch, Discord, and other social media platforms. This is easy access to all of your favorite streamers and allows you to stay in touch with your friends. In addition, you're protected with GX's free built-in VPN and ad blocker services. Personalization is robust and easy on the eyes. It uses a comfortable dark color scheme that can also be changed. If you like animated wallpapers, you can have those too. This will absolutely be your new favorite browser. Check the link in the description down below to download it and thank you once more to Opera for sponsoring. I wanted to do this video a little different, I plan it to be a very open-ended discussion. I will still give my take in the final two sections and compile all of my thoughts from the research and the feelings that I have, but I will hopefully present both sides in a fair way and try to give you some tools to answer the question yourself. I don't intend to tell you a solution to the problem, because if there was such a simple solution, then I wouldn't be making this video. I want to provide as much information as I can, that way you can let me know in the comments down below what you think. All right, so where do we start? It's such a multi-layered issue that I guess the only approach is to peel the onion one at a time and start with the actual pro players. I've seen quite a few people say that pro play and solo queue aren't really that different. It's mostly just a skill difference because challenger players are better than gold players. Now, this is obviously true. Pros will be the best players on the planet in any given game. But if you think that pro play, the organized professional scene, is not that different from solo queue and League of Legends and they're not entirely different games that work on different rules, let's try to break this down for a sec. In pro play, you have a team of five players who are as good as you can possibly be in the game. These players know each other, even sometimes live together, they practice together, scrimmage together. The org will have coaches, analysts, and team meetings about strategy. They'll know their teammates' strengths, weaknesses, preferences, playstyle, champion pool. It's possible that they'll have a world-class facility like Team Liquid's Alienware building. I've personally been there, and it's really awesome. They will design strategies around each player's skill set, 
they are paid to win, which is very important as well. And when they do play on stage, they have no ping or lag, and they can communicate through voice comms with their teammates. They go through a pick and ban process that involves a snake style draft against another team who does all of those things too. In solo queue, however, you queue up at 2am after not playing for 7 months, you find a team full of random people where someone bans your champion, you highlighted somebody first times a champion, people rage, flame, feed, and grief, they have FPS lags or ping spikes, the ranking system uses this algorithm to determine who plays against who, which sometimes means that an autofill jungler is against the smurf Kha'Zix one trick, or even ironically people are calling you bad considering that all 10 players in the exact same elo with the exact same win rate are in this game. Oh and of course, there are no voice comms. Solo queue and pro play may share the same name, League of Legends, but they are nothing alike. And it's more than just the skill difference. I would actually argue that something like Clash, if it's 5 challenger players against 5 other challenger players, or even Twitch rivals, if all 10 players are challenger and have practicing together for a week or so, I think that's significantly closer to being like pro play than challenger solo queue is. When you play 10 games a day of solo queue by yourself all alone just trying to get diamond, it's barely the same game as the world championship, yet we play on the same version of the game as the pros do. Riot has decided that the best approach is to change things every two weeks, according to where it's strong at that point in time. If something is strong in pro play, it will be nerfed down. And if something is strong in solo queue, and especially low elo solo queue, it's still possible to be nerfed on that very same patch. In the patch highlights, they note the reason why a certain champion was nerfed. Naturally, some people like this and argue that Riot is currently doing the right thing, and others will quote and say that's the reason they quit the game. So who's right? Well, nobody really, since there are downsides to both balancing around pro and balancing around everyone else, but let's run through both the approaches now and give some examples of their pros and cons. By far the biggest issue that comes from balancing around the competitive scene is that when strong champions are played at the comp level, they have to be nerfed for us too. A good example is Kalista. After she got released for basically an entire year, she was pick or ban in the pro scene. They could never buff her because challenger players would abuse her to extreme levels. She was really good in organized play because the rend could secure Baron and Dragon. Her strengths with a coordinated support that you trusted and had synergy with was just completely unmatched in the bottom lane. She would end up being nerfed like a dozen times, and ever since then she's never been able to recover in solo queue. She is rarely, if ever, a good pick, and never has a win rate above 50%. On top of that, she's way too hard to play for the reward that your average solo queue player is looking for. It's not worth learning her. But that's a very important distinction. Champion difficulty. The players understand that champions like Akali may never have a good win rate because she's just so hard to learn. If you remember when she was the best champion in the game, her absolute peak of pro play dominance and challenger solo queue nightmares, she didn't have above a 50% win rate on average. The champion was broken, but the average silver to platinum player would still need practice on her. In that situation, it's fairly understandable that Riot would not be buffing Akali just because lower elo players who weren't practiced on the champion couldn't give her a good win rate. Balancing around the highest levels of champion prowess makes way more sense, because if people can't pilot clearly overtuned champions just because they're hard, well, that's user error, not champion error. It's pretty rare that anything will balance around user error. Competitive gaming, life, school, doesn't really matter. Making the test easier just because you failed doesn't make you smarter or more knowledgeable on that subject. Only studying and learning will. Making the test easier just increases your grade. For the seven years that I've played League of Legends, I've always held this opinion, and I knew that Riot would nerf hard champions that are overpowered when mastered, even if their win rate wasn't that good. And I was okay with that. However, something just recently caught my attention. Lilia is a unique champion. Up until recently, she was the only champ in the entire game never to receive a balance change. After being out for 9 months, she had avoided the patch notes. In pro play though, she has been strong since the day that she came out. This season, she's held around a 60% presence in pro, which is extremely high. She's been a top tier jungle pick along with champions like Hecarim, Udyr, Talia, and Graves for competitive this season. But as you probably guessed, her win rate in solo queue is abysmal at best. 
It's crazy how often this really happens in League of Legends. It almost feels like it's a requirement for good pro play champions to have a terrible win rate in solo queue. A top tier professional jungler with the dead last worst win rate in jungle. And as the story goes, on the most recent patch, Lilia, even with the worst win rate in her position, got nerfed. And we've seen this happen to many champions, like Azir, Ryze, Nidalee, and Tom Kench. The champions just feel like they're not allowed to be good for the average player. But here's the thing. Did this nerf happen because Lilia is hard to play? What if we compared Lilia to another AP jungler that's seen in pro play that's known for hard farming? Nidalee. Clearly, Nidalee is one of the hardest champions in the game. There's so much that goes into playing her at a top level that you'd be better off trying anything else for success. There's a reason that for over the last couple years, a win rate below 50% is pretty common. Ever since they reworked her into the jungle and out of the solo lanes, decreased the width on her spear hitbox, and moved her towards a hard farming pro jungler style, the average player just can't get the hang of her. Lilia is not super easy herself. Using the champion's full power involves a lot of game knowledge. Her strengths as a hard farmer and counter jungler just like Nidalee requires an understanding of jungle pathing. It's not as simple as going buff to buff and ganking level 2 as Ramus. The early game Ramus point and click ganks are easy enough for anyone to understand and master, but Lilia is different. First off, you have to learn to prioritize the Raptor camp because of how much healing that you'll get back. You also need to learn to kill Gromp and Blue Buff at the same time to maximize efficiency. While sometimes risky, your absolute best path is usually an invade to the enemy Raptors and start their camps at level 1. Because of your fast clearing, you have a good chance to 3 buff the enemy jungler. You don't have any CC for the Scuttle Crab, so you need to make sure you have enough time to take it and you won't get blown up. Maximizing your passive movement speed while you fly through the jungle will ensure that you can keep up the hard farming pace. It's essential that you hit enemies with your outer circle because the true damage is the only thing that keeps your damage early game competitive with other champions. You have to learn to kite and sort of orb walk around your enemies using your movement speed to make sure that you can keep hitting the enemy and they can't hit you. The champion will take a little bit of time invested to fully realize her potential, but she's still not as hard as Nidalee or Azir. It feels like challenger players have no problem abusing Lilia and finding great success with her, so you would expect that her win rate would increase with ELO. But here's the biggest thing that shocked me. Mapping out Lilia's win rate per ELO over the last couple of months paints a different picture than I originally thought. The champion did not go through any balance changes, yet her win rate does not increase in higher tier play. All ranks has the biggest sample size, and while it technically includes challenger level games in that data, it's so heavily skewed towards lower elo, it's basically like saying silver to platinum data. As I've covered before, just 3 ranks in this game, bronze, silver, and gold, cover 86% of all players. If you throw in iron and plat, you now have 98% of all players. Diamond through challenger games isn't even 2% of the player base. It's astonishing how flat this curve is. In some cases, the higher elo games didn't even have a higher win rate than the lower ranked ones. A fair question that you might have is why did I not include challenger only games which you can sort by on u.gg? The biggest reason that I didn't is that challenger data is such a small sample size that variance is bound to happen. For example, Lilia didn't even have 2000 games played in challenger on the previous patch, but in case you are wondering her win rate was still 48%. After looking through this, I knew that I needed to make one for Nidalee so I can compare them. My suspicion is that Nidalee would have a more pronounced curve, and sure enough, she does. There is a clear increase for Nidalee as you go up in ELO. It doesn't jump up to 55 or 60% or something like that, but on patch 11.5, the difference between her all ranks win rate and her master plus win rate was 4%, but on the very same patch, Lilia's would only increase by less than 1% to the same jump. It feels like the Lilia nerf is not happening because she is super hard to master and is a broken champion for climbing solo queue after you have 500 games on her like Nidalee. The Lilia nerf is happening because pro play and solo queue are literally different games. When champions are strong in professional play, solo queue players end up being punished. The pro style of play where junglers are farming more and gank a little less because of better vision control, smarter communication, is just way better for Lilia. They play around jungle pathing a lot better, and invades are far more coordinated and strategic. When you can talk to your mid laner, when you can talk to your bottom laner, when people buy control wards, you can make much better use of the fact that she has the best jungle clear in the game. 
Lilia is like the complete opposite of a pub-stomping spam ganker like Shaco, who thrives in the chaos of solo queue and lack of coordination. Lilia just gets better with coordination. Obviously, this sucks for our dear friend, and it doesn't feel like there's anything Lilia mains and Lilia players could have done to prevent this. But now let's talk about why Riot might not have a choice. There have been extremely popular games in the past that have had their pro scene change the rules of the typical game that you and I would play. So if we were in our public matches playing Team Deathmatch, Search and Destroy, or Team Slayer, we wouldn't see the same thing as the pro players. Some of the better examples are Call of Duty, with Call of Duty League restrictions as well as COD 4 Pro Mod, and Halo with MLG variants and game battle rules. To make matters a little worse, a lot of the leagues would go by these sort of gentlemen's agreements or unwritten rules where they didn't want people to abuse something that existed in the game. In Call of Duty 4, the grenade spam by taking frag times 3 for your first perk was easily the best choice in the game. Everyone knew that, including casual players, yet if it was your first time watching the eSport, a big question you might have is, why in the world are none of these pros taking it? Later on, you'd find out that at certain tournaments, players either agreed to outright ban it or promised to not take it. In the early days of Halo and MLG, the variant usually had a set of rules like everybody starts with the battle rifle, there's no secondary weapon, weapon spawns were halved, no radar, stuff like that. Call of Duty League has to be the most extreme offender of this I've ever seen. Look at how many restrictions there are, how many changes to the base game that they've made. You can only use like 30% of the game's content. Pros will use the same weapons all the time, not because they're necessarily overpowered, but because the list of weapons and items they're allowed to use has been restricted by that much. This weapon, the Rampart, pretty much gave Luminosity a championship, gave them the win, at CWL Fort Worth. In terms of respawn, Classic of LG went from a 0.82 without it to a 1.17 with it, which equals out to a 0.35 difference. When LG needed an X Factor, because Formal clearly wasn't having the best of it in his life, neither was John, and when Classic had that rampart in his hands, when he went from, like I said, a, what was it, a 0.82 to a 1.17, that's what did it. But whenever we all saw this, whenever we were all witnessing the Grand Finals and watching LG perform throughout the winner's bracket at Fort Worth, the players sought out and said, all right, we need this weapon taken out. We, we've seen enough, we already know, and needs to be taken out of the game. It is far too powerful for our liking. And for Luminosity to respond the way that they did, who wouldn't, right? Who wouldn't look at this current system and say, why would we want to get rid of a weapon that just helped us win an event? And you know what? They shouldn't have to. I think we can all agree that that's pretty lame. Overpowered or not, in the name of balance or not, there should never be that many restrictions to a game's competitive scene. What's the point of removing half of the game's content in the name of balance, when watching the best players use overpowered things might actually be pretty fun and interesting? Or what if somebody comes up with a counter strategy to things that are deemed overpowered? How can pros get creative, experiment, or even break the meta when the meta has been predetermined for them? The weird thing is that many of these restrictions would come at the request of the pro players themselves. They would complain and cry that certain things weren't that fun to play against, and many of the leagues would come together to ban them. I can definitely sympathize a little bit with the pro players here, because if something is flat out broken and unfun and unfair to play against, you may not want your entire competitive career and your job and salary to be determined by something like that. But at the same time, if it's a part of the game and we as casual players have to deal with it, we play with it every day and we see it, then the pros should honestly have to as well. Imagine if League of Legends professional players could just remove champions because they are unhealthy. Which, by the way, brings me to Viego. If you've been watching Pro League of Legends ever since Viego's release early on this season, you might be wondering why he hasn't shown up in Pick and Band yet. He's clearly a good champion, challenger players have abused him for free LP, the champion is good. But Viego has been restricted from pro play ever since his release, and until further notice, he will not be seen. This feels so bad for a solo queue player like myself. If a champion is actually that buggy, that unhealthy, and prone to game-breaking issues that it has to be banned from pro play for more than two to three months at this point, well, 
that champion should have never been released, number one. That's that's the first thing. But I also believe that he should not be allowed in solo queue either. If he's so buggy that Riot does not trust that he won't break the game for pro players, why in the world is he enabled in ranked? Viego is the newest champion in League of Legends as of this recording, and already Vanderil has made more videos about his bugs than any other champion in the game. He's by far the buggiest champ we've ever seen, and we all have to play with him every day. If League Pro players played on a different patch, that would make them stream less than they already do. If solo queue had different champion numbers, item changes, disabled champions, they wouldn't really have a reason to play solo queue. That would ruin the marketing and stream of the pro player, as well as the teams, the orgs, all that kind of stuff. The consistency that is kept by having everyone play on the same patch allows the casual player to be able to relate to these pros. We get to see the game as we know it, with no special rules or restrictions. Now that we've outlined both sides of the problem and why Riot might have the answer already correct with what they're doing, yet clearly non-pros are suffering through no fault of their own like in the case of Lilia, where do we go from here? This specific issue in League of Legends is a little different than some other games. I think one thing Riot has to do is start to close the gap between how solo queue and pro are played. At least in the case of Call of Duty, public matches can be kinda competitive when you queue up with your friends. All of you are on voice comms, you might strategize by giving each player a specific role, use a specific gun, a certain strategy, it can be really cool. But in League, solo queue is just that, a solo experience. We've been taught and bred to have this game be a 1v9 solo game, where your teammates are basically a part of the enemy team, and they've tried to make non-solo queue modes work. Right now, we technically have flex queue, but nobody takes it seriously. Clash is taken more seriously and can be a lot of fun, but it's not available 24-7 and has a significant barrier to entry, where you kind of need four friends and a lot of time on your hands. In the past, Team Builder was another attempt to make teamwork and role queue a lot better, but it had the longest queue times in history. I remember waiting easily 15 to 20 minutes minimum to get into Team Builder matches, and that's us even accepting a Draven support, because at this point, who cares, just queue up and start the game. So how come all of these things haven't become the new norm, and solo queue hasn't faded out of popularity? Well, in none of the competitive games has solo queue ever gone away completely. The fact that you can queue up at 3am by yourself and get into a match works well for everybody. The low barrier to entry where you don't need friends or hours and hours of time on a Saturday night like Clash makes it easy to hop in and go. Completely irrelevant of your schedule, you can play solo queue at any hour of the day, whether you work at night, whether you work in the morning, you have school, you don't have school, you can just get in and go. Solo queue will always have a place in these games, which is why it badly needs a couple of upgrades. First up is voice comms. I'm sorry to say it, but it's just time. If you think that people will be extra toxic on voice comms, you may be right, but the mute button deletes that instantly from happening. This game needs communication. In the last few months, I've put in over 100 hours into an FPS called Squad, and the teamwork on that game is one of the most enjoyable experiences I've ever had in gaming. Everybody has a mic, works together, barely anybody is super toxic, it feels like a competitive environment, and the game doesn't even have ranked matches or ranked queues, it's just that fun to use teamwork. Yeah, this game is it's addicting, bro. It's so easy. It it's pretty fun. It's so easy to play, I guess. I love how this server yeah, always has just the same players. It makes it feel like like a I don't know, like a community. Community, yeah. <laughs> like a community. That's cool. Yeah, I got one. Yo, we're coming in with with big boys. Sink G down. Yeah, they're at the rock formation that hey, we were just at. Just... Alright, uh, tag two. That's a uh, retro dig. Go fix things up. The second major upgrade are rewards. Riot has put in some incentives with these rank splits, but they straight up suck. Most people don't even pay attention to them. If I asked you right now what do rank splits do, what are the rewards, and how do they work, would you even know off the top of your head? Riot needs to swallow some of their profits and let people get free skins. If you hit a higher rank than you ended last season, you should be able to pick one free skin for the champion that you played most in rank that year. If you already own all the skins on that champion, you should be given $10 to $15 worth of RP. $10 worth of RP to keep someone engaged in your game for a whole nother year will more than pay for itself, Riot. We need rewards that we actually want, 
not Hextech RNG crafting. Something people need to understand is that if the rewards are really good, toxic players would be missing out on getting a free skin so they might think twice before they type. Nobody really cares that much about missing out on Hextech crafting, but if a gold cane main who can't afford Odyssey cane and has always wanted it is trying to reach plat so he can get a free skin, this season he might turn off that enter key just to focus on playing the game like he should be doing anyway. The third thing we need is more punishments for bad behavior, and I do have to give credit where it's due. This season, Riot implemented some loss mitigations for AFKs, they let you surrender early, they punish people faster with Lever Buster, and has made rank this season slightly less annoying. This isn't just filler steps, these are genuinely good things in the right direction, but they need to increase the penalties for AFKs, make us lose even less LP if somebody leaves the game, and reporting in Champion Select needs to feel like it matters and does something. And the fourth and final step is to remove autofill. For some reason, I feel like nobody wants to address the real root issue with autofill. The problem with autofill and why it has to exist is for long queue times, but long queue times come from the fact that nobody wants to have a bad solo queue experience. If ranked was more enjoyable to play, with voice comms, rewards, punishments, more players overall would play it, thus reducing the necessity of autofill. The final thing that I want to talk about is the pro meta itself. I'll admit that I'm not the most knowledgeable when it comes to competitive play. I'm not a former pro like Nemesis or Kadrill. I don't do VOD review on pros like Dom or LS. Those guys are super smart and know far more than I do, but I do still have some questions. It's true that Lilia should have been looked at because of her 60% presence in pro play, but my question is why does any champion have a 60% or higher presence? A champion being picked in 60% of all pro games is kinda crazy, yet that's not even the highest. This season, Kai'Sa has an 84% presence, which means that in 84% of all champion selects, the teams decided we cannot let Kai'Sa either not be picked or banned. In some cases, champions might have had a higher presence than they probably should have if they were good in multiple roles. A flex pick like Silas or Akali in previous metas saw tons of play because Silas was viable in three roles and Akali was viable in two roles. But that is not the case for Kai'Sa, as she's only an 80 carry, which is insane to think that she's not only that much better than the rest of the game as a whole, but that much better than every other champion in her own role. Surely a pro 80 carry could list off some matchups that Kai'Sa has that aren't very favorable. I think I've heard Ezreal and Aphelios can do well into her, so how come they're not played more often? If other AD carries are so below Kaisa's level that she can't even be directly counterpicked anymore, isn't that a huge problem? If Kaisa is so overtuned that all possible counterpicks are subsided, why in the world is it taking so long to nerf her accordingly? It's fine that there will be strong champions in the meta, and this season Kaisa has been the strongest champion in the game at the pro level, but I would still hope to see her presence around 50%, maybe 55%, not 84%. Isn't it a massive problem that there seems to be so few situations in which you can have a counter strategy into one champion pick? This brings us back to the actual nerfs that Lilia received. Even if the goal was to nerf Lilia because of her pro play presence, which I do agree with and is understandable, why is the nerf that she ended up getting just a straight ultimate cooldown nerf? Shouldn't the approach from Riot be to try and buff something that would help her out in solo queue where her win rate is dead last in the jungle position and then nerf her accordingly for pro play? Why not buff some damage but only to champions in compensation for these ultimate CDR nerfs? It could give her more carry potential inside of solo queue while also making sure she doesn't have an even faster jungle clear. They could nerf her ultimate CDR which does decrease her utility for pro play, but if they couldn't figure out a good solution that would help her out inside of solo queue, then maybe she shouldn't be nerfed just yet. Maybe they should look to prioritize buffing her weak matchups. This video was not made to tell you that I found the solution. This should be a genuinely open-ended discussion where you guys can tell me what you think in the comments down below. I'm excited to see what you say, and I hope that as a community we can voice our concerns in a fair and constructive way. However, it's worth noting that no game has done this correctly, which is why there's no perfect solution to this problem, but rather a list of a few improvements that we could look to make. If you enjoyed this video, I thank you so much for making it all the way to the end and for watching. Please check out my Patreon and 
and like and subscribe if you enjoyed. Over on the Patreon, I have video editing tutorials, so if you like the editing in these videos, I run through all the different effects that I like to use, and I'll be posting two video editing tutorials every single month on Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave a like and comment. It really helps out with the YouTube algorithm more than you might even think, and I will see you guys next time.